Good afternoon. I'm Howard Davis. I'm Chief Technical Officer at SIBSI, and it's my pleasure to take some time this afternoon to talk through uh, an introduction to the Building Safety Act. The Act was passed last year, but uh, it's only in the last few months that many of its provisions have come uh, into full effect. There's an awful lot to cover in the next 40 minutes, um, and the slides from this afternoon will be available um, from SIPSI. There's a lot of material that will appear on the slides that I simply won't have time to cover, but it is there for you to look at afterwards. And I would encourage you to um, spend some time afterwards looking over the slides. There's an awful lot there, and um, as I say, I will only be able to touch on some of the headlines, but I hope I'll give you plenty to think about as well. So moving on, um, what I'm aiming to cover today is set out on this slide. Um, I want to cover the full scope of the legislation, and that's not just the Building Safety Act, uh, but also the Building Act and uh, supporting measures. Um, I want to talk through the recent changes to the Building Regulations 2010 that came into force on the 1st of October. I do want to talk about the changes uh, regarding competence in our sector. And also, uh, I, I want everybody to go away very clear that the Building Safety Act is about all buildings. Um, and I do want to talk about the new regime um, for higher risk buildings as well. So in summary, it's a time of unprecedented change in our sector. The Building Safety Act is almost certainly the most far reaching change to the legislation since the Second World War. It applies to all building work, and I will emphasize that at one or two other points in the course of the presentation. It regulates operation and occupation of higher risk buildings for the first time. And for anyone who's wondering what do we mean um, by that, um, I, will, um, I will come back to, to that a little later and share the detailed definition with you. And also, I'm sorry, my slides are, thank you. Um, and also, we do need to bear in mind that the Building Safety Act is not the only major area of evolving policy in our sector. We have the Climate Change Act and net zero carbon targets and net zero carbon policy, um, which is perhaps evolving slightly more uh, than we had either appreciated or hoped a few months ago. So there's a lot going on in our sector. So by way of introduction, why are we here now? Um, and I, I apologize in one sense for showing the next slide. In another sense, it's absolutely essential that I do. Um, and you will see why. We're here now primarily, um, and you know, we absolutely must not forget because 72 lives were lost on the 14th of June, 2017. Um, and that's the coverage from Sibsi Journal uh, at the time. That triggered an immediate response in the form of the Independent Review of Building Regulations and Fire Safety, which was undertaken by Dame Judith Hackett and published in 2018. It also triggered the Grenfell Tower Inquiry, uh, which uh, sat for several years. The phase one report came out some time ago. The phase two report is still awaited and can be expected to make a number of uh, recommendations uh, for further um, improvements to the built environment. Um, one of the early industry responses was to create um, an industry steering group, which in turn set up a, a competence steering group. And that looked at competence across the industry. And it's worth saying that this work began before Dame Judith Hackett's report came out and um, was 
heavily influenced by the, the review Dame Judith undertook and led to quite detailed regulations around competence. And we'll see some of that cropping up a little later in, in the session. So going back to Dame Judith, what did Dame Judith find? Well, she identified four key issues underpinning what she described as a systemic failure of the building control regime. Um, the first, ignorance and misunderstanding of regulations and guidance. Um, an indifference to quality and safety at the expense of speed and cost. A lack of clarity on roles and responsibilities uh, and of accountability. And inadequate regulatory oversight, inadequate enforcement tools, a lack of enforcement action and therefore of deterrence, and a very widespread view in the industry that compliance didn't pay and actually that non-compliance did pay. So picking up on the first of those, I want to touch on the um, approved documents. Now, Dame Judith's comment was a, a, a confusion between um, regulations and guidance. So I hope everybody is reasonably familiar with these approved documents. Uh, they're quite um, important to the building services sector, but they are all approved documents. So what is an approved document? Well, this is text taken from one of the very first pages of any approved document. I took this one from part L, but it's the same text in every one. Approved documents are approved by the Secretary of State and give practical guidance on common building situations about how to meet the requirements of the building regulations for England. Different approved documents give guidance on each of the technical parts of the regulations. They now go from A to S, with S being the vehicle charging part. They're all uh, listed in the back of the approved documents. In addition to guidance, some approved documents include provisions that must be followed exactly as required by regulations or where methods of test or calculation are approved by the Secretary of State. And in our own area, you can think of doing SAP or SBEM calculations, which are a prescribed uh, method of test or calculation. And indeed, air tightness testing, the method of air tightness testing is prescribed. But the approved documents are guidance. And each one covers the requirements of the building regs um, relating to a different aspect of building work. Um, and building work must comply with all the applicable requirements. It's worth stressing that the approved documents, back to the second line of text, give practical guidance on common building situations. Um, so, for example, somebody wheeling out approved document B and its guidance on staircases and wanting to apply it to a 50 storey block one might ask the question is that a common building situation is the approved document actually giving relevant guidance to that scenario um, it's also worth um, emphasizing the text in yellow building work must also comply with all other applicable requirements so the scenario that i'm afraid unfolded at the public inquiry after grenfell tower the the people responsible for the thermal performance upgrade on the building thought about part l but by their own admission did not consider the requirements of part b of the building regulations um, with the tragic consequences that we all witnessed so that's the approved documents here are the regulations and uh, I hope prominent on that is the Building Regulations 2010. And now the Building Regulations etc. Amendment England Regulations 2023, which largely came into force on the 1st of October and makes some very significant amendments to the building regs. Um, they are the regulations. Schedule one of the regulations contains the functional requirements, parts A to S, 
And that is what you must comply with for all building types, not just the common ones. I, I hope you don't mind me laboring that, but I think it's really important that people recognize because the new regulatory regime will be very focused on whether buildings comply with the regulations, not on whether they have followed a certain piece of guidance. And those who recognize that and act on it will find their dealings with the regulator uh, will probably be much more straightforward. So um, regulations and functional requirements. Um, I've picked three from part B. Um, means of warning and escape. The building shall be designed and constructed so that there are appropriate provisions for the early warning of fire, appropriate means of escape in case of fire from the building to a place of safety outside the building, capable of being safely and effectively used at all material times. That's what it says about getting people out of a building in a fire. It's very short, it's very straightforward. There is an approved document to support it, but that is the functional requirement. Here's the one on external fire spread, which if, if I can put it this way, don't stick stuff on the outside of a building that's gonna help a fire to spread. And then here's internal fire spread. And I've highlighted number four uh, because I'm, I'm conscious from a lot of conversations recently that there's a, a growing tendency to use pre-insulated um, pipe work. I wonder how many people stop and ask, where's that pre-insulated pipe work going? Is it going to be running down a ceiling void above a means of escape? And have I stopped to think about the fire performance of the insulation on that pipe work? Or am I only thinking about part L and thermal performance? Um, in the light of, uh, of the events at Grenfell, um, we do need to learn that lesson and think about all aspects. So what we're being asked to do is to comply with the functional requirements. Actually, there's nothing new there. Um, I think it goes back to about 1965, um, you know, before um, England had even won the, the Soccer World Cup. It goes back a long way, um, but we're now being expected to get on and do it properly. Um, there are going to be some new processes, so new building control processes, and I'll say a bit more about them. Um, also, a need to demonstrate that people are, are competent. And again, this isn't just for higher risk buildings, this is for everything. And uh, clients will have responsibilities to make sure that designers and contractors are competent. There are additional requirements for higher risk buildings, which I'll talk about in more detail. And the regulator has been very clear that enforcement will be proportionate. So they will be much more focused on the higher risk buildings where the consequences of a failure to comply could be much greater. Um, but that doesn't mean that they're not interested in other buildings. And I think we can anticipate there will be an increase um, in enforcement um, going forward. Important to say that the government has accepted all of Dame Judith's findings, they've passed the Act, they've set up the regulator, they've defined higher risk buildings, they are regulating the building control profession, there is a new regime coming in, it's not yet complete for construction product safety and approval. There is a new competence framework for all in the industry. As I say, new procedures for work on higher risk buildings, and that will include very robust control of product substitution and design changes, of which more a little later. So moving into the legislation uh, itself, and um, where are we now? What's the new system? Well, we have the Act, and it's worth saying that um, it's a wide ranging piece of legislation. It's worth asking ourselves what's covered by it. It was introduced in response to the Grenfell Tower tragedy, but it's not all about high rise apartment buildings. And I do meet far too many people who think because the act is a response to Grenfell, it's only about high rise blocks. 
Nothing could be more wrong, I suggest. Um, the Act applies to all regulated building work undertaken in England. And uh, if we want to remind ourselves, Regulation 3 sets out what constitutes building work. Yes, there is a more onerous and rigorous set of requirements for higher risk buildings, but that is overlaid on top of the reform for everything. And just to illustrate the point, obviously applies to that. No prizes for guessing that on the South Bank in London. It applies to that and it applies to all of the blocks you can see, even the six storey one on the right. A, because it's a building, so it's covered. B, it is part of a, de a development of taller buildings um, and is therefore very likely all to come under the scope of the same uh, building control procedures. But it also applies to this, or indeed to this. My comments about proportionality apply. The regulator will be much more interested in the two on the left than the two on the right. But if something goes wrong in one of the two on the right, the regulator may choose to get involved. And many of the rules that we're talking about will apply. Is the work being done in the, the lower right being done by competent people? Are they operating in a safe way? It's all in scope. And that's the um, regulation for reference. So important that we, we clear up what a, res, what a higher risk building is. Now, this is split across two um, parts of the, of the package. First, in the Building Safety Act, there is a new section inserted into the Building Act, which says that a higher risk building is a building in England that is at least 18 metres high or has at least seven storeys. And it's also got to be of a description specified in regulations. Now, you might say, well, why didn't they put it all in the Act? Because if you put it all in the Act, you then need primary legislation to change it. If you have the height threshold in the Act and the description in regulations, you can add further building types much more easily. That's why it's been done that way. And at the moment, the three types of building described in the regulations detailed there are um, a care home or a hospital, they have to meet the height threshold, but a care home or hospital that meets the height threshold, or a building which contains at least two residential units, and that's the, um, the apartment blocks. Now, it's also important to note that um, the, the buildings that, with residential units that meet the height threshold are a higher risk building throughout their whole life. Care homes and hospitals are a higher risk building until they are completed and then they come under different regulatory regimes, workplace regulations, health and social care regulations, and there is no need to add a further regulatory regime for those buildings in operation. There was no regulatory regime for occupied residential buildings and so we now have one and, and that is why they are higher risk buildings in occupation um, and I'll go through the structure of the Act in a, in a little more detail in a minute but they're covered by part four of the Act. I've talked about proportionality, uh, it's important that people recognise that um, the regulator will pick their targets carefully but if you want to do a little bit of follow-up read the press notice that's linked to at the bottom to show that it might be a single storey building conversion in Derbyshire, but if it goes wrong and somebody is badly injured, someone will end up in court. Now, aims of the Building Safety Act to remedy the systemic issues I touched on earlier, to make people more accountable and responsible for fire and structural safety issues, um, to set up the regulator, to define higher risk buildings, to set out the regime for improving competence, to improve the framework for construction products in the light of all that has emerged at the Grenfell Tower inquiry, to give residents a stronger voice in the system, to give them rights to information about the places where they live, 
It also extends the scope of the Defective Premises Act, which I'm not going to touch on today, but you need to be aware. And there are additional leaseholder protections, which again, I won't touch on today, but that's not because they're not important. Um, it's just that that is not so directly relevant to, to uh, us, I don't think. And finally, driving a change of culture in the industry. Um, and perhaps we'll come on to one or two examples of that a little later. So it's an act in six parts, introduction and scope. Part two sets out the new regulator and what its duties and powers are. Part three is a major rewrite of the Building Act. And it's worth saying that that applies uh, to the Building Act for England and Wales, but the changes um, in Wales will be implemented separately by the Welsh um, devolved government. Part four, um, high risk buildings in operation. Part five covers some changes to architects registration and particularly the construction products provisions. And part six has various bits of legal detail and transitional arrangements. Um, and also the enabling provisions around building remediation costs. So the regulator is set up in part two. It is now responsible for the building control system. And that's all work that requires building control approval. They have set out standards and they are in the process of setting up a statutory register for all building control professionals. It will be a regulated profession operating under their competence framework and code of conduct. And the building safety regulator will oversee enforcement with the potential for criminal sanctions in the worst cases. For all higher risk buildings, the regulator will be the building control body. And they will be overseeing competence requirements for work on all buildings. And I have put in here the text from um, part two of the act that sets out what, what that means. So assistance and encouragement to everybody in the industry in general and particularly to building inspectors so there's quite a bit in there really part three um, an extensive revision of the building act and um, these changes apply to the act and therefore to all work there are some major amendments to the building regs as a result which we'll touch on in a bit and as i say um, the, the provisions I'm talking about today apply in England, Wales, um, it is devolved. Um, I sometimes say jokingly, and I think being Welsh, I'm allowed to say this, it, it, in Wales, they have part double L and part double F. The changes include the creation of the gateways, the design and construction, and I'm going to say a lot more about that in a minute. And there are powers that haven't yet been used to regulate competence of any appointed person. And uh, back to regulation three for building work. So part four, high risk buildings in occupation. And this sets out what's meant by building safety risk, fire and structure. What is a high risk building? We've covered that. Accountable persons and principal accountable persons. Um, what is meant by occupation for higher risk buildings because without the necessary certificates that's another offence requirements for registering higher risk buildings and the need for building assessment certificates and safety case reports the golden thread keeping information about the building not just keeping it but maintaining it um, and engagement with residents and their requests for information and finally enforcement duties compliance and appeals so quite a bit in part four too part five changes the rules for architects registration um, and um, if you if you'll forgive me putting it this way architects can now be put on the naughty step in public so if they are subject to disciplinary orders that will be published there's also provision for new homes ombudsman there's some material in there about service charges and redress for leak leaseholders but the really important bit in part five i think for us today is the significant changes around construction products 
and all construction products made available on the UK market will be regulated. They're not all yet, but they will be. There will be a requirement that construction products are safe for their intended use. There is a proposal to create a list of safety critical construction products and significant new liabilities on materials producers for defective products. And this is all in addition to the existing product safety regulatory regime. It needs to be stressed that this aspect of the new regime is still evolving and emerging, and we can expect to see more in this area. But building liability orders have been brought in, uh, which mean that where products are defective, the manufacture and, and they cause the building to become um, uninhabitable uh, because it's defective, the manufacturer is on the hook. Uh, there are powers in there. And again, this bit applies to the whole of the United Kingdom uh, around construction products to make sure that things remain fit for purpose. There's a new national regulator uh, for construction products within the Office of Product Safety and Standards, um, and that will report to the Department of Leveling Up, um, even though it doesn't sit within Bayes, now it sits within the Department of Business and Trade, um, but Diluc ministers are responsible. So I've mentioned that the building regs um, are, are being amended, and uh, we'll take a little look at what that means next. So there's a major overhaul of building regulations and a whole new part, part 2A, dealing with duty holders and competence. There are new regulations for the building control process. There are significant changes to the system for initial notices and for obtaining approval prior to starting work. <clears throat> In some cases, HRBs, starting work without approval could be a criminal offence. Again, covers all work under the building regs. And Regulation 38, which is about provision of fire safety information, has been very significantly beefed up. And both contractors and clients need to confirm in writing that the information has been provided and that the client thinks it is adequate and understandable. And that applies to all buildings, for higher risk buildings, they've got the golden thread, which is Regulation 38 plus. Now, if anybody is not aware of the new Part 2A of the building regs, and you are a designer or a contractor, can I gently suggest that you go <clears throat> to the legislation website um, download the building regs 2023 and have a look at part 2a because um, on any job you've been appointed to since the 1st of october these regs have applied clients have to make suitable arrangements for planning managing and monitoring a project and to ensure compliance with all relevant requirements Clients also have to make sure that the people they appoint to the project are competent. And this is all aimed at making sure that if the building, uh, that whoever designs the building knows what they're doing and will produce the design that if built will comply with all the relevant requirements. So it's back to the relevant functional requirements, not just following the guidance uh, and making sure that people are, are able to do that. There are also some significant duties around cooperation. They are now a statutory duty. So if that hasn't got everybody thinking, I'd better read part 2A of the building regs, um, then I'll just have to try harder in the next few minutes to, to encourage you. Um, there's, there's a section uh, which deals with the considerations to be addressed before making appointments. And again, can I stress, this is for everything. It's not just for higher risk buildings. Um, there are, there's a general regulation on, on competence for designers and contractors. There is a specific one each for the principal designer and the principal contractor. And then um, there are provisions should the principal designer or contractor um, leave the project and be replaced. 
And can I be really crystal clear? Um, I've bumped into people who say, oh yeah, we know all about principal designer and contractor. We've had that under CDM for years. It's nothing new. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. Why would Parliament and the government create nine new pages of 17 regulations to say something that's been in CDM for years? It wouldn't. And what's in the building regs is not what's in CDM. They're new requirements and people need to appreciate that and get to grips with them. There are also some interesting things in there about necessary behaviours of people claiming to be competent. One of, one of which behaviours is being prepared to say, no, I'm not prepared to do that because I don't think it will be compliant if I do. Now that's going to get interesting on site, um, but that is what's um, being expected. You know, people are being being told you have a duty to look at what you're asked to do and ask, is it compliant? Will it be compliant? And if not, say so. The other area of saying, saying no is if you're asked to do something that you don't have the skills, knowledge or experience for, you should say so and not just say, mm, make it up as I go along. Part three of the revised building regs covers notices, plans and certificates. And I'm not going to go through this. It's the sort of slide you need to look at and, and reflect on for a few minutes. Um, but um, initial notices are being significantly restricted. Uh, and we now have an um, application for approval of full plans. Um, and again, um, that's either to the building control, the, the local authority, or if it's a high risk building, it's to the regulator. Uh, and uh, there is also a new regulation which requires some consultation about plans for non-HRBs that fall within the scope of the fire safety order. Um, they will need some consultation with the uh, fire and rescue service. So there is going to be a new culture in building control. They're not going to just turn up, have a look and say, well, we can't find anything wrong. We'll give you a certificate um, because all that means is they haven't found the flaws. It doesn't mean the building's compliant. Nowadays, the regulator is going to turn up and ask the contractor and the designer, you demonstrate to me that the building you are building or have built is compliant with the regulations. Where's your evidence? And that could be documentary evidence, it could be photographic evidence, it could be evidence from commissioning records, testing uh, records, whatever. But the building control body will want to be convinced that the designer and the contractor think they've built a compliant building and can back it up. They're not interested in what guidance you followed, they want to know whether you've met the functional requirements. And my suspicion is that the more questions they ask, the less reassured they were by the early answers. And they don't have to issue certificates or accept reports. And if they don't issue a certificate for an HRB, you won't be occupying it. Well, you might choose to let people occupy it, but that might lead to somebody occupying Wormwood Scrubs um, or somewhere similar. Um, I know Wandsworth would be preferred, but um, I don't think it's as easy to get out of that one now. There are criminal sanctions for occupying buildings that are not properly certified. So on building notices and approvals, there are some changes in the wording of the regs to take account of the creation of the regulator, and it's worth people being up to speed with what those changes are. Regulation 38, fire safety information. Um, Dame Judith was very clear about the lack of compliance. And so this has been really beefed up. And again, I would say, please go and look at it. I need to move relatively quickly now onto high risk buildings. And uh, this gives you the background to the procedures. Um, local authorities and approved inspectors are no longer the building control bodies. And any HRB that started after the 1st of October 
will now be entirely under the um, responsibility of the building safety regulator. Um, so higher risk building work is building a higher risk building, doing work on an existing higher risk building, turning a building into a higher risk building. So um, converting a block of, uh, of offices into a block of flats. And there are two separate processes for new HRBs and for existing HRBs. And what is required is set out in detail in Regulation 4 of the Building Higher Risk Buildings Procedures England Regs. And again, you can see why I've put the detail in the slides. If you're working on these, you'll need to go away and have a look. But I'm going to give you a quick headline. Gateway 2, there's been a lot of talk about it. Um, Gateway 2 is where you have to submit a detailed design to the regulator. And again, this is the private study afterwards. but here is a list of all the things that, oops, sorry, that the regulator is going to require. And that's just for starters. They're also going to want a competence declaration, a construction control plan, a change control plan, a mandatory occurrence reporting plan. And if anybody wants to read up on those in detail, the link at the bottom of the slide will take you to recently published guidance from the regulator. They will want to see in the proposed design how it will comply with all aspects of the regulations. How are the team competent? Have you got a decent plan to manage construction so that what was designed is actually built? When changes are made, how will they be assessed? Um, it's all there in detail. And Please note at the bottom, the application has to be signed off by the client or they have to confirm that they agree with the application being made. They can't um, hide and then say later, oh, nothing to do with me, Gov. And the regulator will want to see sufficient information to show how that building, when it's built, will satisfy all the applicable functional requirements and they want you to demonstrate how you will manage construction activity to that end. Now, I have had an inquiry um, ahead of the, of the webinar uh, about um, Gateway 2 and design and build. And I'm going to turn the question back to you as the audience. Once you've seen in detail what you've got to do at Gateway 2 for an HRB, do you think that a traditional design and build with a scattering of contractor designed portions spread around the, the design is going to get approved by the building safety regulator. Uh, I think you can guess what my thought on that is. So moving swiftly on, Gateway 3 um, is when it is built. And I'd summarise this by saying the regulator will want to be convinced that what you've built is compliant and that it's followed the, the design and where it hasn't followed the design, then you've followed your change management plan and recorded the changes. You'll also need the golden thread information to hand over to the accountable person and the duty holders will need to submit prescribed documents um, to the regulator. And again, um, the detail is spelt out in those procedure regs. Uh, and if you're working on HRBs, you need to have your legal and contractual people uh, all over that so that you understand what you're required to do because without it the regulator simply won't sign it off. Once it is signed off the accountable person um, for the building in occupation will need to register the building and apply for a building assessment certificate which will evidence the fact that it's safe to occupy. And again, what's the regulator going to want to see? They will want to see that if any standard or document is cited in support of an application or as evidence uh, of construction, how does that document allow you to fulfil the functional requirement? Again, um, I've put a link to the relevant bit of the guidance in the slide. Um, 
A number of documents will be required on completion, and I've listed them here. Uh, they're, they're mostly things that are, have been needed earlier on in the process. The change control log, obviously, will have been developed during the process. And there are a couple of declarations required on completion. The contractor and the designer have to sign off a compliance declaration. What we designed and what we built complies with the functional requirements. And that's in there in the regulations um, for, for, for people to comply with. Moving quickly to the golden thread and then a few closing remarks. The golden thread is the information that allows you to understand the building and the steps needed to keep both the building and people safe now and in the future. That's the definition that's been around for a couple of years. Um, it's the information that's needed to give the right people the right information at the right time to keep the building safe and to support duty holders and accountable persons in maintaining that building in a safe way and managing fire and structural risks. Now, it's very much a process. The golden thread is not a software solution. It comes from Dame Judith's report, if anybody wants to go and look back. And it's found in section 33 of the Building Safety Act, which is where the very high level requirements come in. And then there are more detailed requirements in the high risk buildings keeping and provision of information regulations, uh, very much applicable to existing HRBs. And again, the detail is in the regulations because it can be updated more readily. We've seen the definition. This is going to change the way that HRBs are designed, built and managed, because you've got to stop and think from the beginning, how do we make sure that this building is going to be compliant, is going to be safe, and that we can maintain it in that way? There'll be a lot of interventions in the building during its life, and the information will need to be kept up to date. It is going to require a change, as, as I've already said, in the way that we work. So the golden thread will drive change. It will inform the safety case for occupied higher risk buildings. And that safety case will need to be submitted to the regulator periodically, no less often than every five years. But in some cases, they might want it more often. And those involved in the building need to work together to maintain accurate data based on correct assumptions about how the building is being managed. And this is all going to be stored um, electronically, is the term used in the legislation. But it is going to need some change in, in the industry and the way we go about this. Existing HRBs should all be registered by now. The deadline was the 1st of October. And as well as being registered, they have to provide information about the building to enable the building safety regulator to prioritise their assessment of the 13, 14,000 or so existing higher risk buildings. And those, I'm sure everybody is aware, tower block in Bristol last week that had to be evacuated. Uh, reports suggest it's a large panel system block. Um, is it unreasonable to? Uh, suggest that perhaps the regulator will be prioritising any other buildings that have identified themselves as large panel system buildings um, in their registration. I, I suspect they'll want to have a good look. Buildings will need safety cases and there is guidance from the regulator uh, with uh, a link uh, and also the statutory requirements. Well, so what? Um, we have got a new legal framework for all work that builds, uh, goes beyond the CDM model. We've got new duty holder roles. We've got explicit competence requirements, again, for all work. We've got a unified structure for building control. We've got the regulator overseeing competence and performance of building control and the building control of high risk buildings. Um, and we've got new regulations, they're up and running. We've got new enforcement provisions, which are more um, stringent than they used to be. Time limits have been extended or removed, and there is provision for compliance notices and stop notices. 
if you are served with a stop notice working on a higher risk building, you will have to disclose that when bidding to work on any other HRB for the next five years. And failure to comply with those notices will be a crime. We've talked about building control and that there is a new regime for higher risk buildings that includes the golden thread, occurrence reporting, completion certificates, and also they're being regulated in use. So accountable persons have a duty to demonstrate to the regulators and to their residents that they have effective proportionate measures in place to manage safety. And those who don't may face criminal charges. I'm going to scoot fairly quickly through these slides just so that you know they're there. There is a link to um, the, the relevant regulations. Um, there is an update on the most recent secondary legislation relating to HRBs and what those cover. There were other regulations laid on the 17th of August and they are detailed on this slide. There's a lot of material on the Sibsi Journal website um, which uh, helps to get you up to speed on many of the issues covered in the last 45 minutes. And there is further reading on the government website and indeed on the Sibsi and the HSE websites. Um, and that's all detailed there. Um, the final um, thing is to say that we, uh, we at Sibsi um, provide um, a, a fuller training um, session, a, a day long training course on the Building Safety Act for those who want to get into it in much more detail. And uh, that's available uh, to uh, anyone to sign up. We do also run that course specifically for companies and we have done several of them now. Um, we provide, as, as is shown in the last link, we provide a fair bit of information on the website, which has recently been updated, but we're constantly trying to uh, follow up on the latest uh, announcements. And then finally, we are in, in the course of developing something that Sibsi President Adrian Catchpole announced earlier this year, the development of a, a chartered firms scheme. Now, that is not going to give people a silver bullet or a badge that says, I'm, I do, I'm OK under the Building Safety Act, but it will be a significant piece of evidence that the company has engaged with these issues and is, is working to um, design and build in a compliant manner. So with that, I'm going to stop. I'm going to say thank you for listening. And I'm going to uh, see if there are any questions in the chat. Or even possibly in the question session. Um, yes, now, I, I, I think I said at the beginning, we will be making the slides available. I don't know how that will be done, uh, but we certainly will. Um, the building safety regulator sits within the HSE, so it will be regulated in exactly the same way as the HSE. It's answerable to the Department of Leveling Up and therefore to Parliament. Um, Interesting comment from somebody that the HSE inspections have only focused on the operations rather than building services. Um, I don't, I, I don't have experience of that. I anticipate that any building services that are linked to life safety will come under increasing focus. Um, and bearing in mind that the new regime is only six weeks in, um, I suspect that this has scope to develop. On the issue of um, height, it's 18 metres from the lowest ground level at, outside the building to the top of the floor surface of the highest habitable storey. So if you have a top floor that's nothing but plant, it doesn't count. Um, if you have a roof terrace, that doesn't count. Um, there are details of how this is measured in one of the HRB regs um, and the link, the link and a comment, this is how you measure it, is in one of the penultimate slides.
Um, if you have a mixed use building, um, then um, if part of that mixed use is residential, if it's over the height threshold and you have more than two units, it's a higher risk building. And what you do is then up to the competent people who either designed it or are advising if it's an existing building. There is no book that says, if you've got one of these, do that. If you've got one of these, do the other. It does not work like that. Um, it, every building has to be assessed on its merits and a competent person will need to uh, address the question. Hotels are not HRBs. They are within scope of the fire safety order. And that's why they've not been included in the HRB category, because they're already regulated uh, under the fire safety order. And I do know that fire and rescue authorities have spent a huge amount of time post Grenfell looking at the hotel stock. Um, if it's a domestic building, then there are some specific rules about clients and competence. Um, basically, if, if I as a householder get a contractor in to do some building work, it's the contractor who has to be competent. Uh, no competence is assumed of homeowners. Um, moving down the list, there's a question about um, product manufacturers and competency. Um, and yes, uh, well worth being aware of the Construction Products Association product competence paper. Um, product manufacturers need to be careful uh, because what constitutes providing um, information about your product? When does that potentially stray into providing design advice? And um, my understanding is that there is going to be a PAS for product manufacturer competence, um, and that will obviously be an important place to look. Uh, but m manufacturers and product suppliers need to think carefully both about the information they provide um, and uh, how they make sure that they don't end up unwittingly becoming designers. Um, There's a there's a good question about design and build. Um, uh, do I consider it inappro only inappropriate for HRBs? Um, I, I'm I'm going to be slightly evasive here, but again, actually, I want to turn the question round. The requirement of the Building Safety Act is that people build buildings that are compliant with the building regs. Now, you can use any contract mechanism you like, as long as you achieve that outcome. But what I would strongly encourage people not to do is to say to a building inspector, oh, we're using such and such a form of contract, therefore we can't do what the Act requires. Because especially if it's an HRB and it's the regulator, they will just say, well, then you're not going to be doing it. When you've worked out a way of building a compliant building, come back and tell us. Apologies that some people have had audio problems, um, but that one is well and truly beyond me. Um, industry template appointments don't cover the new professional, uh, the, the, the new principal designer role, and there are no registers of PDs yet. Um, well, actually, I don't think the regulator expects a register. Um, I'm, I advise one charity that is looking at getting some building work done and has needed to um, interview people. Um, we have looked at it and said, do we think these people have the competence to act as our designer? Where is the evidence of that? How would we show the building control body if they asked us? Are those people, do they realise that they need to be principal designer? Are they willing to do that? Do they think the evidence supports it? That's what we've done. We don't need a register. We don't need a template. Um, I hope I'm not going to offend anybody. Um, some of this is about common sense and people taking a bit of responsibility. 
and not expecting somebody else to write down what they've got to do in another document so that when it goes pear-shaped you can pick up the document and say well it's not my fault i followed what this document said that's exactly what dame judith wants to get away from and what government wants to get away from it's about people looking at what they're being asked to do and taking some responsibility now i'm mindful we've got about two minutes left um, a new railway station will not be an hrb unless it has a block of flats above it that meets the height threshold there is a transition period for hrbs that are currently being built and i'll be i'm not being evasive it's so complicated you'd have to go and read the regs for your project a huge amount of work went in for trying to cover the various bases um, so that's what you need to do if it's been designed and a substantial start has not been made on site then it comes under the new regime what's a substantial start um it's not a trench somewhere in the area where the building is going to be built it might be a completed set of foundations or a full set of piles again um, that will ultimately come down to the regulator um, i hope we've got several questions about the slides as i say they should be made available and not only the slides you will need to follow some of the the links um, templates um i'm i'm just going to say in one of the things the hsc have been really clear about is that they have a complete aversion to templates and checklists um, they want people to actually sit down and ask what do i need for my project so i don't think there'll be any templates appearing on the hsc website anytime soon and finally, I'll finish with the question about HRBs following the gateway. No, they don't. If it's not an HRB, you don't have to follow the gateway procedure. You just have to make sure that you can show why you think you've complied with the building regs. I'm really sorry, there are more questions, but I'm not gonna be able to tackle them. Uh, we are out of time. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope it has been helpful. Um, I hope that I've given you a clear steer on the new regime and that above all you're able to make use of the information um, and uh, adopt the new rules and regulations in your own work thank you very much for listening <laughs>